I just saw, I actually saw that I was walking around on a path in a totally lonely and grey concrete city that was abandoned. Mm-hmm. I was walking and felt this deep sadness in me. And at the same time, I knew that this was my life. Well, while walking along this path, I looked behind me and everything was grey. And this made me really sad, this image. There were no colors. I was talking to myself. This can't have been my life. Mrs. Egregus, you refer to yourself as an artist of the senses and consciousness, as a mediator between the worlds, meaning the physical, visible world, and the non-physical, invisible world. You suddenly went blind at the age of eight. Years later, you became ill from an autoimmune disease and you also had a near-death experience during a major surgery several years ago. This experience had a particular feature because you were able to see events. Not only was it possible to subsequently prove that these events had actually happened, but they also changed your life in the future. Before we speak about these experiences, would you tell us a bit about your personal history? What brought about your loss of sight? What did you experience at the time? As you've mentioned before, I was eight years old when it happened. It was three days before the summer holidays were about to start. I was in grade two in primary school, elementary school, and we were hanging out in the schoolyard during the long break at 10 a.m. I was looking at the Danube, and all of a sudden, I saw these gray dots. They were like those fruit flies, you know, these tiny dots. And they became bigger and bigger. And at one point, this happened within a few minutes, everything was gone, and I went blind. At the time, you wouldn't immediately call an ambulance and so forth and so on. So in the meantime, the school day ended, then it took a while until my parents came back home and so on and so forth. And of course, they couldn't believe it. They thought it was some sort of a nonsense game made up by a kid. I can still remember every detail. Pink Panther was running on TV. And then my mom asked me to tell her what I saw on TV. And I just said, black. And then we went to hospital the next day. And there, the ophthalmologists confirmed that I couldn't see anything. Only then, the whole ordeal started. We were sent to the eye clinic in Vienna, and there they confirmed it as well. At the time, laser technology had just come to Austria. The whole thing happened in 1983, and with the help of this laser technology, they soldered things together again. The retina had detached itself. That's what they found out then. These findings were sent around to all the specialists in Austria, because nobody could explain why this had happened. There was this groundlessness that had come out of nowhere. It wasn't like an accident that had happened or anything along those lines. But Principally, the problem was a retinal detachment. Yes, this had happened physically. And then they just soldered the retina together again. After spending a month in hospital, the doctor allowed us to go to Turkey by bus, for home leave, so to speak. And three days after we had arrived in Turkey, everything was dark again. This means that you'd been able to see after the laser treatment. Yes, one month plus a few days, but just in theory, because I had spent that time under a mask, so to speak. 
because my eyes were blindfolded. But you know, try to explain this to a kid. I always lifted up my eye patch a little bit on the side and followed my passion for painting. Well, that's what it was like ever since after the second blackout. I stayed blind, but as a child I didn't find it that horrible. It was even thrilling to see the world in a different way. I wasn't scared at all. The trauma came a lot later, when I was a teenager. And nothing could be done anymore from a medical standpoint. No, the eye doctor that had performed the surgery at the time, he did, I'll never forget. My mom told me years later when we talked about these topics that he got teary-eyed because he had hoped so much that the surgery would work. He said that he had expected it, but more like in my mid or late 20s. However, I thank heaven that it happened when I was a child. Because when you're 25 or 30, you have a job, maybe a family or whatever. You're in a completely different phase in life. And it is a lot harder to learn something and dip into this world than as a little girl. And as a child, you were able to cope with this situation with hardly any difficulties, relatively speaking. Totally. I still remember the day when we went to the school for the blind. And at the time, we didn't have the internet where you'd just check online and you'd find all this information. At the beginning, I was even sent to Turkey because my helpless parents, and when I say helpless, I mean this in a completely empathetic way. This is how I'd like to be understood. They didn't know, what shall we do with the kid now? They had to go to work. They sent me to my grandmother in Turkey. And then they found out sometime later that there was a school for the blind in Vienna. And then we started this proper pilgrimage in Vienna and went from one place to the next. So this whole journey was quite thrilling. And it seems like yesterday, when I felt braille writing under my fingertips for the first time. I was so fascinated, because at the time I already knew how to write. I was so fascinated that these dots were supposed to be letters and that it was possible to read them. Well, and this is how everything began. I went to boarding school. This was the more negative aspect of it all. To be away from home from one moment to the other. It would be a lie if I said it was easy. It was like that. But even then, I was able to cope with the situation rather quickly. And I spent several years with my, let's say, siblings at boarding school. It only became a big problem for you during puberty. Yes, totally. Especially in puberty, this became a huge issue. Because it's the time when you start being interested in the other sex and the cool boys, let's say, in the seeing world. And I was extremely vain at that age. I didn't want to present this to the outside world, if you know what I mean. And it was very difficult for me that I wouldn't get any of the cool boys and that I had to take, let's say, what was left. And this was very difficult for me. But as mentioned before, this was during puberty. Fortunately, I was able to overcome these things with everything that came with it. And then... Der Tod hat in ihrem Leben schon sehr früh eine Rolle gespielt. Sie haben Death already played a role early on in your life. As you had told me before this interview, within the years of 1984 and 1987, you lost three people that were very important to you. Amongst them was also your father, who drowned in the Danube. What was this time like for you? How did you deal with these losses? What conception of the world did you have? Ich muss dazu sagen, ich... Well, first I've got to say that I didn't become the person I am today, but that I've always been different. When I was a small child, I already talked to my father, God bless his soul, about spirituality in my own way. Although I should mention that spirituality wasn't a thing in my family at all. 
Although we are officially members of Islam, we just did the standard things, as you would do in Christianity too. What I mean is, we'd celebrate all the holidays and so on. But I always had a different perception of things. At the time we were living in a region of the surrounding district of Linz, called Lending. There, everything's pure nature. There are forests, fields and streams. And the valley Zaubertal, where actually an exclusive residential area used to be. And we happen to live in that area too. And at the time, I already philosophized with my father about God and the world on a childlike level. And that's how I was able to internalize all these things. When my little nephew passed away in 1984, it was truly horrible, because he was still a baby. As you can see, I still get emotional, because it was still such a small life. And then, as mentioned before, my uncle passed away, and just a year later, my father. And the day my father passed away, there was already an omen, namely in so far. We came together on Mother's Day, and after that, he brought me to the bus that would go to the boarding school. It was a collecting bus for pupils. And when we said our farewells, he told me, This is the last time we've seen each other. And I couldn't accept this, this remark. I said that he was speaking nonsense. And it was a Wednesday when my father died. And at night, from the Wednesday to the Thursday, I had dreams I'll never forget. They were so horrible about the end of the world. Those dreams were really horrible. I didn't see any images, but the experiences and emotions I had in this dream were horrible. The feelings you had? Yes. And the next day, when I woke up, I had a really bad eye inflammation and couldn't leave the boarding school to go for a walk. Here you can see how everything's cut out for you in life. And I was in the boarding school and all of a sudden the porter called me up. And I'd never been called up, up to this moment. And in my heart, I could truly feel how things were tearing apart. It was as if threads were tearing apart. I still haven't been able to grasp it, up until today. But somehow I managed to overcome the huge distance between my schoolmates and the porter within milliseconds. I must have beamed myself over there. That's what it felt like. And I opened the door and the first thing I said was, Mommy? And she answered. And then I said, Daddy? And he didn't answer. However, I didn't know they'd come. I couldn't have known because it was out of the ordinary. And when my dad didn't answer, I knew it in my own way. I just cried out, Daddy's dead! Daddy's dead! Without knowing what had happened? Yes, yes. And of course, I'm a very emotional person who's very temperamental. And also my zodiac sign is Arius. And so I crushed more or less literally against brick walls. And hab einfach ja total durchdreht, klar. Well, I really... I couldn't cope with the pain at that moment, and I just went crazy. And then, relatively soon, I got the image that my dad was on an island and that I couldn't go there. Das ging relativ bald, ja. This happened quite soon, but coping with this bereavement, well, this pain, this sudden loss, a person that would have given me support in this stage of life, this took 30 years to overcome. I mean, I was 30 years old. As mentioned before, I was 12 years old when my father passed away. This is a very significant age. Well, at the age between 18 and 20, I'd already gained my own experiences. And that helped me to cope and find closure in a different way. 
abschließen lassen können. Sie hatten eine sehr enge Beziehung. You had a very close relationship with your father. After his death, did you have the feeling to be close or in contact with him? Definitely. This was very exciting. Of course, I was often seen as being weird, but I've always talked about it, also in boarding school. There were many moments where I'm sure that he watched over me. He was there. But at the beginning, when I knew he was there, I was scared and ran away. I knew it, but at the same time, I was... It was a creepy situation. When you're a child and suddenly you feel this energy in a room, you know it, but at the same time, you don't know it. They were so real that you could feel them? Well, the first time he literally appeared, he passed through the room. I was eating at the table and was working on my homework. I was doing maths. I remember every detail. Maths used to be the subject we always worked on together. Actually, that's something I'm only realizing now, after so many years. Well, that there is a connection. And he was... I was sitting at the table opposite, and suddenly I could feel somebody behind me traversing from the right to the left of the room. And it was clear to me that it must have been my father. Did this happen rather shortly after he had drowned? This happened? Yes, this must have been at around that time. If it was a year or two or five weeks after he had died, I can't tell. I just know that it happened still quite at the beginning. And I remember that I ran out of the room screaming, because at the same time I was so scared. Because I wasn't used to it. And later on, it became a usual thing that more and more people who were not physically present tried to get in contact with me. And those contacts with your dad decreased after a while? Yeah, well... Yes, because I also realized that I didn't want that. I didn't want him to be an alert in his world all the time. Let's phrase it like that. I'm trying to humanize it a bit, because I can't describe it in any other way. I didn't want to have this feeling that I need my dad at all times, who, let's say, would constantly look after me. But there were enough clues that he, let's say, got involved in two things. When and how did you feel the first signs of your autoimmune disease? As everything in my life, this episode in my life also came out of nowhere. It happened on a Thursday in October 2000. I was still in work at the time. Well, I was working at Telecom, a communications company at the time. And I had just started working in Linz. Before that, I had worked in Vienna, and in 1999, I moved back to Linz in Upper Austria. And I was sitting in the office sometime in the afternoon, when it was already relatively quiet. And all of a sudden, as always, the phone was ringing. I picked up the phone and could hear myself slur, as if I was drunk. And I was thinking to myself, what's going on now? My first thought was that I was having a stroke and that I hadn't noticed it. My tongue was really affected by it. And when I called my mum, so I would know whether this condition would stay, or to just see what was going on, and it stopped. I had no idea what had happened, and this condition started to repeat itself once a week. So once a week I had this slur, and slowly this started to increase, and at one point I was certain that something was wrong with my body. However, since it was still quite rare at this point of time, the doctors thought it was psychosomatic. We don't need to talk about it, but for me, every cause of an illness can be found in the psyche. But at that point, it had already been physical. But the whole ordeal, until I was given a diagnosis, took two years. 
And in the last year, it was so bad that my muscles stopped working completely and I needed nursing care. So the muscle functions in your body decreased? Well, the diagnosis was myasthenia gravis. And the only muscle that was not affected by this was the heart muscle. Apart from that, every muscle in the body was affected. And then signs of weakness happened, because the transfer between the synapses didn't work anymore. And then the muscles didn't do what they were supposed to do anymore. And also in this last year, I couldn't eat or drink anymore. And I lost 30 kilograms. Thank God I had built up some reserves before. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to overcome this. And then I was finally able to convince the doctors that they would examine me in hospital. Because I couldn't take it any longer. Because I knew if they didn't do anything soon, I would die. Because I couldn't take it any longer, physically speaking. This means you were in pain as well. Uh, no. But my strength, my strength. I mean, if you can barely eat and drink and you only get something into your body zip by zip or just a few drops without suffocating, life wasn't fun anymore. And here it was the same. It took a long time until a diagnosis was made. Thank God the chief physician, intuitively, at least I think it was more intuitively, that he guessed the diagnosis, because all his assistant doctors had the opinion that he was wrong. So I let them explain the disease. And while they were telling me, I said, this is going to be the diagnosis. I knew it. I could feel it right away. That's it. And then they did the examinations accordingly. On Monday, when the doctor came for the doctor's round, he held my hand and looked at me. Because of this hand pressure, I could tell that he'd come with the diagnosis. And I looked at him. I can still remember every detail. I laughed and cried at the same time. The doctors who were present were a bit irritated by my reaction. I just said, I'm so glad that he found a name for it. Now you finally knew what the problem was. Yes, because now it was easier to cope with it. And of course we looked at the options, but there weren't many. Because as mentioned before, not many people are affected by this disease relatively speaking. And therefore, not much research has been done. That's a fact. How common is the disease? At the time, there were about 350 cases in Austria. Of course, this number has increased because autoimmune diseases have increased a lot in the past few years. So there were a few medicines to choose from, and there was also the option to remove the thymus gland. Because due to this diagnosis, they knew that the thymus gland was enlarged. And as you know, the thymus gland is responsible for growth and turns itself off when puberty starts. The activity is reduced because of the growth hormones. And when they were working on the diagnosis, they found out that it showed tumor-like activities and that it would be good to remove it. And then I knew that I didn't have time anymore to find alternatives for myself, because my body wouldn't have lasted much longer. So I decided to agree to this surgery. That was in 2002, when it subsequently came to a near-death experience. Yes, and I should also mention that when you suffer from myasthenia gravis, the doctors are extremely scared to narcotize the patient. Because due to the weakness of the muscles, complications can happen. That's why they were even more baffled how fit I was after the surgery. However, this fitness didn't last long. The next day, I remember it clearly. I was in the hospital ward and they served pizza margarita for lunch. And my husband at the time came to visit me. And I asked him to cut off a micro piece of the pizza for me, because I wanted to have a little nibble. 
And when I put that piece into my mouth and tried to swallow it, I realized I was about to suffocate, and I could only communicate by hand signals that he had to act real quick because I couldn't breathe anymore. And then all the staff ran together, and I was moved to the intensive care ward. I mean the surgical intensive care ward. And they knew that I had to be moved to the neurological ward. So I was moved there, and there they did this medical intervention the next day. They performed a plasmapheresis, meaning they filtered my blood, which is done to reduce the antibodies. And this medical intervention was horrible. Absolute schlimm. Do you mean concerning the pain? Yes, because I'll just tell you the way it is done. Because they open up your carotid artery while you're fully conscious, without any local anesthetics. And that's just, you know, humans have the survival mechanism that tells you, help, no. And when you are already weak, as I was, and as in my case, I was weakened, and the stress was just unbearable. And I can clearly remember the thought I had. I knew it's over now. I'm done. And my last thought was, Daddy, you died the same way. The suffocation. And my last thought was, Ah, Papa, you are also gestorben. This is ersticken. And then I briefly regained consciousness again and realized that the doctors were very busy. And I was thinking to myself, I don't want to live anymore anyway. Because of that pain, you know, the pain was so... I rather wanted to pass away than endure this pain. Well, and then the journey began. Because suddenly, I realized, as mentioned before, of course, I didn't have any sense of time at that moment. Mm-hmm. I just saw, I actually saw that I was walking around on a path in a totally lonely and grey concrete city that was abandoned. Mm-hmm. I was walking and felt this deep sadness in me. And at the same time, I knew that this was my life. Well, while walking along this path, I looked behind me and everything was grey. And this made me really sad, this image. There were no colors. I was talking to myself, this can't have been my life. And then... And then, let's say there was this change of sequences. Then I experienced how they were dealing with those devices. I sensed all these devices, and I also saw that I was wired, and so on and so forth. And then the hospital staff brought me to my mom, to her apartment. Of course, this didn't happen in the physical reality. Before we continue, I would like to ask you more about this internal image that you described earlier. You saw grey concrete and you missed seeing colours. Why did you feel this need to see colours? Because as somebody who is blind, wouldn't you be used to not seeing any colours? Well... Colors are still as important as they used to be in the past. What I mean is, I'm living in a very colorful world in my life. So colors are still as important as during the time I was still able to see colors. And to me, colors are life. And this was what you missed? And that's why it was clear to me that this, so to speak, this grim life was shown to me. Do you know what I mean? I understand. I knew immediately that this was my life journey, up until now, and that it had been just grey and not exciting. And then there was a change of scenes? Yes. And as mentioned before, there was a change of scenes as a whole for me. Of course, I don't know how much time had passed in the meantime. I can't retace it in the least bit. But the events were like that. 
I could see myself being brought to my mother and to her apartment. And I was attached to all those devices. I was able to sense, experience, see and feel all those things. So you mean what the devices looked like on you? Yes. That's right. And the story was, it was the combination that seemed crazy to me. I was experiencing all these things and the hospital staff was bringing me to my mom. Of course, this wasn't the case in reality. And I saw my mom sitting on the couch, where she actually always used to sit. Although I should mention that I'd never seen this scene in my real life because we hadn't lived in that apartment yet, in the apartment that I saw there. What I mean is, I hadn't remembered this image from the time when I was still able to see. So, in this image, you experienced being close to your mother, although in reality, you were actually in hospital at the time. I was in hospital, and my mom was in the apartment. And now we get to the thrilling part. And I saw my mom sitting there, and she was knitting something in red. And I saw that it was red. I knew my mom didn't hear me. I was aware of that. I was completely aware of that. And her whimper sounded so horrible to me. It really tore apart my heart. Because at that moment, I knew that there was nothing worse that could happen for her now. You know, when I wouldn't come back anymore, and I promised her I'd come back, and this was exactly the moment I started going back into my body. And when I was officially brought back to hospital, so to speak, back into this world, into this world of experiences, and there was this auxiliary nurse who was called Rainy, and he told me, listen, and the radio was on. And there was this classic old dry radio signal, this familiar sound. You know what I mean? This popular Austrian radio station. And suddenly the speaker said, it's funny because it's so out there, you couldn't make it up. And the speaker said to me, Auxiliary nurse Reini wants to say that there is a girl in hospital. And my name, Gelfide, was mentioned. And if she promises that she wants to live, they will see each other again. And then he actually put a ring on my left ring finger. And this ring was really... And that's something that really shocks me now, because this ring was as oval as the ring I'm wearing now. I'd never seen anything like that as a girl who was still able to see. There was this glimmer in this stone. It was like as if you set fire to something inside a crystal, and it would be alive. I woke up from this coma, and the first thing I did was look for this ring. And then, as mentioned before, the journey back into my body happened. Up to the point of your decision, did you experience anything else, or was the experience near your mother the main event? There were other events too. During one of them, my husband at the time came to visit me, and at the time I had a guide dog. And my husband smuggled the dog into the hospital. In retrospect, these are all just elements that showed me that I had responsibilities. You know, they functioned as triggers to tell me that I had responsibilities and duties, that I can't just kick the bucket. Even though there was nothing more peaceful in my world of emotions than being in this state. So this often described feeling of safety, of warmth, was also very present during your experience. Yes, it was an inner peace. It was like, 
as if I was free from everything, but not from my responsibilities and duties. Well, it was as if this bad conscience was still there. I can't really explain it. I think that's why these images popped up. At the time, the most important beings for me were my mom and my dog. And that's why I think these images were shown to me. So something would be enticed in me, so I would fight, so to speak. So I wouldn't kick the bucket and just go. There's something else I'd like to talk to you about. Because you just asked whether I had experienced other events. It happened during the process of waking up, when I realized that I couldn't move, because I was tied onto the bed at that time. These were safety precautions that if you woke up from a coma, you wouldn't do anything you shouldn't do. And next to my bed, a man was sitting who was wearing white clothes. This must have been this in-between state, where I still had access to the sense of seeing, but at the same time, I already perceived myself as lying physically in bed. And since I was tied to the bed, I could only reach his knee with my fingertips, and his clothes were made of linen or cotton. You know, like the trousers and jackets that are worn by doctors. And I was sure that he was a doctor and he was chewing a gum. And by doing this, he really got on my nerves at that very moment. Talk to me. I don't know what's going on. And this stresses me out. And I realized that I was screaming. But no sound came out of me, at least none that was audible. That was something I was well aware of. And for me, the horrible thing was that during this transition, when I went from this peaceful world back into this body, into this intensity, I came back and first of all, and ultimately, I didn't see anything anymore. I heard those devices ticking around me and I didn't know at all what was going on. And I would have needed somebody who really existed. And heaven sent me this being. And I'm certain that it was my dad. The first moment I realized the connections I said, this was my dad. Namely, he was sitting for such a long time next to me until I actually took my first breath. So he was sitting next to me until the intubation was taken out. And I gradually realized that he was only visible to me, because my sister-in-law came to visit. She showed a reaction that was totally right. When she came to visit me, I was still intubated. And at the time, I really, well, because of her, my hands were untied and I wrote down letters, capital letters, like A and so on. And Sylvia, my sister-in-law, transferred these letters onto a sheet of paper. And so we communicated with the help of keywords. And I repeatedly said, ring and left hand. And she asked me questions and I answered with yes or no. So I nodded or shook my head to say yes or no. And that's how we communicated at the time. So I conveyed the message to her that there was somebody and she didn't tell me there is nobody, but she always confirmed it, so to speak. She accepted that this was the way it was at that moment. And as mentioned before, when I took my first breath, he disappeared, which was very confusing because I was looking for him. I wanted to thank him. And when my sister-in-law came back later, she said, we'll look for him later. Everything's okay. Everything is fine. This means, from a purely physical point of view, you were in hospital, you woke up after the anesthesia and were cared for by your sister-in-law at your bed and you had memories where detailed images of the situation in hospital were mixed with internal images. And these images had a very special meaning for you, for your feelings. Yes. 
This formative image of your mother, did you ever speak to her about it later on and how you experienced the situation? Yes, I did. About half a year later, I mean, at first you need time to process all these experiences. And then I asked her how she experienced me when she came to visit me in hospital and when she saw her child lying there being attached to all those devices, and what it was like for her. And then I told her, you know, what the moment was like when I came back. And then I told her. And she got up, walked to the room next door, and came back with a jumper, a red jumper, that she had made for my niece, who'd been a few years old at the time. And she handed me the jumper and said, there it is. If every one of these net mashes could talk, they would tell you a story. So this was exactly what your mother had done at the time? Yes. And for me this was also the confirmation that the body and consciousness are two different dimensions. And that these, let's call them images, which you saw, had an actual value of reality. The images of the red jumper and so on were not internal. I saw them. At that moment, I also realized that I was seeing these things. So I was aware of that, as much as I was aware that my mom couldn't hear me when I said, I'll promise you, I'll come back. Why did you find a physical correlation with the experience of that ring? Not in the physical world, in the sense that this ring really existed. But for me, it was a message from my angel of life, as I call him who wanted to, let's say, entice me to find my life, my love for life again, with the help of this radio message. Do you know what I mean? That this was supposed to be the declaration of love to life. And I had to promise him to agree. If I was living my life, we'd meet again. In how far has this experience changed you permanently? It confirmed my assumption and my imagination and of my conviction that there isn't an ending after so-called death. That it doesn't end. And it convinced me And this is something that I still like to phrase as paradise is also where I am, or also hell is where I am. This means the way I am in my consciousness at the specific moment, or where I am at that moment, is the same as the way I am when I take off my clothes, so to speak. That's why I didn't feel well at that moment, not only physically, but also mentally. As you could see, I had the feeling that I hadn't lived my life. That's why I saw these images. Is there something you can generalize? What can people do so dying gets easier? Live. And living is joy and laughter. And even on hard days, you can find a silver lining if you train your eyes towards it. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.